Welcome to the Travel Gluten-Free Podcast, where you can listen in on how to lead a gluten-free lifestyle with more fun and ease. Travel Gluten-Free is like having a best friend by your side to give you the most up-to-date gluten-free traveler information. Let Travel Gluten-Free be your number one source for tips, tricks, and advice you can use to safely navigate your next gluten-free travel adventure. Enjoy food, enjoy travel, and enjoy life. And now, here's your show host, Illiquity. Hi friends, it's Illiquity. Welcome back for another episode of the Travel Gluten-Free Podcast. I hope you're having an amazing summer and that your summer has either, you've either traveled already or that you are planning a travel excursion because summer is such a great time to kick back, relax, and enjoy your vacation. Well, I'm super excited today because I have an awesome guest on. My guest today, I met at a podcasting conference and she is phenomenal. She is the owner and host of Talk S-H-I-T. I have to spell it out <laughs> for my podcast to keep it clean with me. She is a mental health advocate and before her podcast, she started a movement called Life with Paula, where she shared openly about her story battling depression. And she says, if you know you're from Africa, if you are from Africa, excuse me, then you know how that is in our communities. And bringing people together who have been secretly battling with mental health and building a safe community to uplift each other. Fast forward to 2020 when boredom struck and depression hit, who knew a podcast would be the safe space she needed? And that is what... T-S-W-P or Talk S-H-I-T with Paula is a safe space to talk your S-H-I-T and feel heard. With this podcast, she's constantly highlighting her journey with mental health, making it a safe space for people to come on her show and talk about their creative journey and battles with mental health, making her show a safe spot where she highlights the struggles and victories. In short, she celebrates the journeys in life and whatever S-H-I-T we are building from scratch while advocating for mental health. I believe there's a power in, in your owning your story and someone out there is listening. A firm believer of authenticity and surrounding yourself with authentic people while uplifting your community and positive vibes along with good energy is why she does what she does. So without further ado today, I'd love to introduce my guest, Paula. Paula, welcome to the Travel Gluten Free Podcast. Thank you for having me. I must say, I don't think anybody has made you do spelling. I mean, is it um, <laughs> spelling quiz on an intro like I have? <laughs> right? It's like the travel gluten free spelling bee. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So today we're going to be talking about Tanzania because Paula is a native of of Tanzania and we all know the best information comes from the locals. So we're going to be talking about tips on traveling to Tanzania, especially if you've never been there before. And Paula is going to give us the inside 411 on what to do, what fruits and vegetables are fresh and yummy in Tanzania that you want to take advantage of and some other things that she loves to do and she's going to share with us today so paula so let's start at the beginning kind of give us some background history on like you growing up in tanzania what did that look like for you and how when did you move out of tanzania into the united states first of all i want to say that you pronounce it so well because anytime i pronounce my country people ask me oh my god do we say it wrong and then they pronounce it, I'm like, you are doing it right. I'm the one who's doing it wrong. And it all is because of the different countries I've lived in, my accent. Like I have an accent of mixtures of all the countries I've lived in. So <laughs> I pronounce stuff. Look at that. I caught myself. I pronounce stuff <laughs> way more different than, than it used to be. But I was born in Tanzania in June 29, 1989. But um, I left my country when I was in, I believe it was in 2001, 2002. I left my country to go to, and um, I started a new life in UK. And ever since then, I've never lived in my country. I go home for holidays. But anyway, I haven't been in my country since then. I left when I was in high school and then I moved to the UK. I did five years in UK. Why am I saying it like it was prison? I did five years in UK. Then I, <laughs> where I finished my high school and I started college uh, and I actually wanted to be a lawyer and then I dropped out. And then I moved to Malaysia where I did hospitality, tourism and events. And then 
did a semester in France because I was under French university when I was in Malaysia. Then I did my last internship in Dubai. And then I came to America for grad school. Wow. That is like an amazing, diverse, like array of places to live. Because people tell me like, they're like, oh, you've lived so many places. But it's like, I've lived in four different states in the United States. So for me, that's like super not exotic. But like you have lived in some amazing locations. Funny you say that because anytime I'm around people, I wish, I, oh, I've moved here, here. And I'm like, well, I don't move states. I move countries. It's kind of a big flex. <laughs> Right. I want to know about your experience in Dubai as a female, because I know Dubai is not a female friendly country. How was your experience there? And what are, what are some of the things like in short, you had to do to walk around by yourself in Dubai and socially acceptable. So just, we all know there's a lot more restrictions on women in the Middle East than a lot of other countries. There is. And, um, and the good thing about Dubai, it's just like the Island I come from, like in Tanzania, we have Tanzania, the main Dar es Salaam, the main city, and then we have Zanzibar, the island. And Zanzibar has its own president, and Dar es Salaam has its own president, but Tanzania has one president. The president of Dar es Salaam also runs the entire country, but Zanzibar has its own president. Zanzibar is an Islamic community, and then um, Dar es Salaam, it's mostly Christians, but it's mixed. But Zanzibar, it's really like how Middle Eastern is. Like, it's very Muslim. You have to cover up. You have to obey them, like during Ramadan. Nothing is open throughout the day because they they believe the entire it's an Islamic island. During daytime, there's no restaurants open or anything. In the evening, everything is open. But I experienced that in Malaysia too. Malaysia is a fully Islamic community country. During Ramadan, or when they have big concerts where it is sponsored by an alcohol company, if you are an, a Malaysian and I said like you can't attend, especially during Ramadan. Like they check your IDs and to make sure. And during Ramadan, if they find a Muslim, like a Malaysian in the restaurant during fasting hours in Malaysia, you can go to jail. If you are a Muslim who is living with your partner and not married, they send you to jail for that in Malaysia. You're not Malaysian. They really don't give the same rules. That's how Dubai was for me because I wasn't from Dubai. It wasn't. So they weren't as strict to us, but they're more strict to their people but it's still alcohol literally i felt like illegal buying alcohol because <laughs> the only places you can get alcohol is either duty free shop or in restaurants and you know of course restaurant bars the alcohol is way more expensive and they're not selling by the bottle so i had of course you know any country i go i have friends and people find side assholes in any way so there was a guy who was selling alcohol in his the boot of his car he would go to, because duty free was far, right? So he would get it how he got it. And then he felt like, oh my God, like literally like he's coming with the paper. And you, you can't even pick alcohol. What he has is what he has. Do you want to drink or not? So if he has vodka, that's what you're going to buy. Otherwise, <laughs> but then I'm like, this is how I feel when I'm buying weed. But then I'm, I'm feeling like this, just buying a bottle of vodka. And it was absolute vodka. Like it wasn't like some of the most... <laughs> But then if somebody wants to knock and say, and you know, it's that thing where a person who knows that person has to introduce you. Like it really felt like you're buying weed or drugs or something because you know, they're scared if you're the pop or anything because you can go to jail for that. But I hate it because I'm like, come on, man. I can't, it's alcohol. Like I'll, if alcohol is this hard to get, how are the other stuff? But right? apart from that, they really, fine. I actually enjoyed myself. I like how to buy treats like if you get a, a job in the government in Dubai or work there like the privileges are so amazing they they really do apart from the simple rules and and that's in any country you go you know you gotta obey their rules but also kind of find a way behind it which you know to them it's legal where everywhere else it's you know, like you can in Dubai, you can say I got I, I got sent to jail because I was buying a bottle of vodka in the alley, and then people will look at you like, oh my god, that's what you went to jail. <laughs> like, you walk in the supermarket here and buy a bottle of wine. <laughs> Funny because those that what you said about alcohol is really similar to where I used to live in Utah. Like you can you can buy it at restaurants 
and you can buy it at the, at the liquor store, but all the liquor stores are closed on Sunday. So you can't buy it in the liquor store. And the only thing you can buy in the supermarkets is like the really, really low, like 0.0001% beer or whatever it is. So yeah, you can't even buy wine in the supermarkets in Utah. But like now where I live in Oregon, there's like cases of wine everywhere because I live in middle wine country. And I'm like, if you have a trouble getting wine in Oregon, you clearly have not stepped into a supermarket because it's like everywhere. And that's the thing, because when I first came to America in D.C., you can't buy wine or anything in, in, in supermarkets or anything. You have to go to a liquor store. Because so I was there for holidays, and I ended up getting a school in Atlanta, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do my grad school here, because technically I was coming just to pass time. I had already accepted an amazing school in Switzerland. It was one of the top five schools in the world for hospitality tourism. I had gotten accepted. I'd even paid my September fee, whatever. I was just waiting for time to, to go to school. My dad always used to say it's more expensive having me in the country than out of the country. So anytime I have vacation, this is the reason why I've traveled a lot. My dad would miss me. He'd have me home for a week and then he'd be like, so I know because my dad always says he's broke ever since I've grown, ever since I've been growing up, my dad's word is he's always broke, but somehow I always end up getting what I want. And then when I grew up, I realized what broke means. Like, yeah, I'm always broke, but I can, I can make money for certain things, but I'm always broke. <laughs> so anytime I would go home, I'd, and my dad would miss me, he'd be like, okay, come home. I'd come home. And then after a week, we'd get in each other's nerve and he'd be like, don't you want to go visit your friends? You have so many friends everywhere. What, which country do you want to go? Where do you want to go? I'm like, but dad, you're broke. He's like, I'll find the money for you. You're my only daughter. I want to make sure you have a good time. I will find the money. Where do you want to go? In my head, I'm like, just say you're tired of me. Because <laughs> my, my, my dad had already gotten used to living a bachelor life, right? And now I'm also grown. Once you send your, your child to go study abroad and live by themselves, when they come home, they're grown. Because I'm like, Dad, I spend seven, eight months, depending on how long you go home. If you go home every semester or you go home once a semester. I used to go home every December. I didn't want to go. I'm like, the other holidays, I'd rather go somewhere else. And if you're in Asia, you're in Malaysia, traveling Asia countries is very easy because you're already around that. I would only go home in December. So I'm like, you haven't seen me for all year. Okay, but then you would always ship me off. So I took advantage of that. And, and I'm grateful because that's the reason I've been able to travel all around and do that because I would take that opportunity. And sometimes I would piss my dad so that he can bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I, so when i came to america i was only here for a stand by like yeah my auntie had just gotten a new position she had a big house she was like my i was like you know what let me go to america and see my old friends and cousins who i haven't seen and i was just here for a time being and my dad was like then i ended up reconnecting with so many people who had forgotten some are even there because keeping in touch back in the days was hard social media was not how we use it has evolved this time has evolved people would write emails but nobody would have computers you know some people had to go to libraries or you remember those days when there was computer cafes, internet cafes yes. where you go and pay for an hour to use and you respond to an email and then you wait for four months again when somebody has money to go to the cafe. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I had forgotten how many people are here. So I was in DC, then I started applying for colleges. I got an accepted to FIU. I was going to go to FIU because I wanted places which were hot. I did not want to deal with cold anymore. That's the reason why I left UK and I went to Malaysia. I did not want to deal with any cold country. And my dad was like, okay. And we had even paid the deposit and everything. Then I ended up sitting down with the dean of Atlanta, GSU. I hate writing essays. So when I was applying for colleges, any college that made me write an essay was being on, on pending. So my essays for GSU were on pending. So I didn't finish my application. So they reached out to me, hey, the dean is going to be in Baltimore. Do you want to hang out with the dean? And I was like, you know what? It's one hour away. My aunt was like, I'll give you the driver. Go. And I sat down with him and he got me interested in GSU. I literally went back home, smoked the blunt and wrote the two essays that were needed. And I even wrote the optional essay. That's how much I wanted to enter that school. There was an optional essay. Mind you, optional. I went and wrote it. This is a person who doesn't like writing essays. I wrote all three of them. I got accepted. My dad is a lawyer, so we found a way to get back our money from FIU. But the uh, school in Switzerland until today didn't want to give me back my money. They're like, unless you got denied a visa or you have 
a letter from the hospital saying you can't travel or anything. They're not giving you money. So then I moved to Atlanta. So when I moved to Atlanta for college and I would walk in gas stations and everything and I'd find wine and beer in gas stations, I would tell my friends in the city, I'm like, oh my God, I buy beer in gas stations. <laughs> and then they visited me in Atlanta because I realized people can be in America and really not travel around. They all have a biggest continent with different... And I have seen people where I've not even left my state. Why? How? Like, that, that to me is, is such a big disappointment. I'm like, in Africa, the reason people don't even travel is because we have the visa process. And sometimes we get denied. But you, Americans, you don't even have to deal with visas. And most of my friends will get mad at me for saying that. I'm like, because... I struggle so much just to travel. If I had a passport that would let me go anywhere, anytime, and I had to struggle for visas and I still struggle, I was like, I still want to go to that country. I will do whatever. And the visa process is annoying and we're still doing. So that did not speak. So none of my friends in DC had ever been to Atlanta. And then when they visited me and actually saw, like, apart from liquor, where you get in liquor stores, everything else you get in supermarkets, you get in, in gas stations. So to me, that was like, oh, so this is not like every state. Similar. It depends on the state, but very similar. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, every, every state has like a different level. Some, mm -hmm. yes, some of them have. And then every, I'm like, oh, because they were not used to coming to a supermarket and seeing wine or anything. They're like, no, we don't get that in. I'm like, oh, okay. No, for sure. And it's funny because you said that because I've had the same experience with a lot of people. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the people who listen to this podcast have probably have been out of their state because they're interested in traveling. But in Utah, where I used to live, there are five national parks and they're like some of the most popular parks in the United States. And there are people I've met in Utah who have lived there their entire life and they're in their thirties and they've not been to one of the parks. So I'm like, you're, you're like literally hours away from one of the most beautiful places on earth. If you've never visited, I think it's because it's like that whole mentality. It's like, oh, well, I'll just do it another time. It's really close. It's right there. And that's what I was going to say. Even for me, like I've lived in, in Tanzania, but then I didn't know my, my life in Tanzania would, would come at such a young end at such a young age because I moved at a younger age. So there's certain things I haven't got to experience in my country. And then I see people traveling to go experience it. And I'm like, how can I say I'm Tanzania? But then I left my country at a younger age. So I have that excuse. When I was in G Georgia State, they were giving all these discounts as a student to go to the aquarium and the CNN and the Georgia uh, Coca-Cola. By the way, CNN is moving out. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm glad at least I went there. Maybe I should do one tour. So those things. And then until people visit you, until I got the first people to visit me and she wanted to do the aquarium, that's when I got to do it. And then in my head, I'm like, I literally could have done this for half the price when I was in college. But because the same mentality, like, I'm still here, I will do it. And then once you start moving, you're like, oh, I have not been to this, I've not been to this, I've not been to Now you start making a list of all the things you need to see before. Because I'm planning on moving, so now I'm making a list. What are all the things I've said I would do in Atlanta that I haven't done? Because it would be ridiculous to move, then now I have to plan trips to Atlanta to go do that thing. Right? But that right. mentality, most of us have, it's like, because we are here, we will do it. And then you run out of time and you're like, like even me in Malaysia, there's certain things I wish I would have done while I was still there. I spent five, almost six years in Malaysia. And then only on my last year when I knew, oh my God, I'm actually leaving this country this year when I graduate. That's when I was trying to pack all these things. But then it becomes, the anxiety becomes higher because the frustrations, because it needs all money. It needs, you're rich. Like if you don't have to worry about budgeting and you can leave that to last minute. It, it's, you know, <laughs> but if you're a person like me who lives paycheck to paycheck and has to plan everything in advance, just start planning, do the damn things. Start scratching out at least two things in a year or three. I know money is tight and everything needs money. So at least, Give yourself two things a year to do. That way you're reducing your list. Yeah, I know. For me, I turned 50 last year and I realized that more of my more than half my life was over. And I'm like, I need to start checking this list off fast. <laughs> and Americans, I'm just here to say Americans, stop just going to DRC and Puerto Rico. There's more places to go see in Hawaii. Oh my God, if I hear one more person talking about Hawaii or DRC or Puerto Rico, 
I'm going to go crazy. Like, there's more out there in the world. And they might hate me, but it's okay. There is a lot in the world. There's a lot to see. All right, my friends. So we're going to take a break right here really quick. When we come back, we're going to jump into the details of Tanzania with Paula and what her local recommendations are if you are visiting Tanzania. gluten-free friends, it's a liquidy. We know that traveling gluten-free can be hard, but you know what? It doesn't have to be impossible. You can still travel and be independent, have fun, and be in control of your life. Travel the way you want to, even with celiac disease. I know because I travel extensively several months out of the year with celiac disease. If you want to get started on learning more about how to travel gluten-free, grab my free ebook, 10 tips for traveling gluten-free. In my ebook, you're gonna find the basics of traveling gluten-free, from the questions you need to ask when dining out to air travel and cruise travel advice. You're gonna find my top tips that I've learned for my expertise. Get your free ebook today by visiting my newly revamped website, www.travelglutenfreepodcast.com. Go to the bottom of the welcome page where you're gonna see the beautiful Caribbean boat picture. Click there and sign up today. Receive your free ebook, which is gonna be dropped directly into your inbox. Remember, go to www.travelglutenfreepodcast.com, go to the bottom of the welcome page and get your free ebook and find out my top tips for traveling safely when you're gluten-free. All right, my friends, we are back. And if you are listening to this on the audio version of the podcast, definitely come over to my YouTube channel at Travel Blue Free Podcast, and you can see audio episodes on video. So today, my guest is Paula with Talk SHIT with P. We're keeping it clean for the audio. Just so funny. Welcome to this. Travel Good and Free, telling me today. <laughs> yes. We are going to jump in today with Tanzania. And so, Paula, for somebody who's traveling to Tanzania for the first time, let's first go over the geography. Let's do the basic 101. Like where is, so for people who are not familiar with it, where is Tanzania located and how big of a country is Tanzania? East Africa, I wish I knew that. <laughs> That's okay. The population, I wish I knew the population, but um, one cool fact about Tanzania is it's 34, 38 tribes. And when I, when I talk about that, that means all those speak different languages. So my dad comes from a different tribe, so there's this language, and my mom comes from a different tribe, so there's that language. And normally when you're born, you take your father's last name and his, his tribe. And then every tribe has, apart from having their own language, they also have their own traditional food. So my dad comes from a tribe called Wahaya. It is also uh, Wahaya, they are close to Uganda. So East Africa is Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda. We share a border with Kenya, which Kenya shares a border with Uganda. So if you're driving from Tanzania to go, you pass by Kenya to go to Uganda. If you're coming from Uganda, you pass by Kenya to go to Tanzania. That's why Kenya tries to claim Mount Kilimanjaro. But FYI, Mount Kilimanjaro belongs to Tanzania. It is owned in Tanzania. Just to make it sure. Kenyan and Tanzania are always fighting about things which belong because we also speak the same language. Ugandans also kind of speak Swahili, but Kenya and Tanzania speak Swahili. Most East African countries speak Swahili. Um, so we, we do certain things. They are similar, but also in their own different ways. Swahili comes from Arabic as well. So we also share that with the Arabic countries, like people in Dubai, whatever, they can understand us. Or um, the, our OGs, our great-grandfathers, Spoke in Arabic, that like the original Swahili is Ira Arabic. Like when you when you talk about speaking the original Swahili, it's a little bit closer to the Arabic side. But you know, as cultures grow and everybody tends to turn languages and shit, so we speak the untraditional Swahili. So there's all that that goes to play. My dad's side, which is the higher tribe, they are. Traditional food is bananas, but trip bananas. They make it and they call it uh, dizzy. And they make it with beans and meat. And it's, it's amazing. My grandmother is 92 last year. She's going to be 93 this year. And until today, she makes the most amazing dizzy. Like, that is one thing. If, my, if anybody right now at home sends me a picture of them eating my grandmother's dizzy, I am going to start crying and being homesick. Like, that's the one thing. <laughs> and, and our family, anytime our grandmother makes that, 
whoever is home, they will be sending that in the group text and we'll all start going crazy. Because she also cooks it like, she cooks it the traditional way. My grandmother is still old school. We have tried to get her to cook in electric stove and she, she does not want that. She's still old school where she puts wood, we call them kuni wood, together and create like a, and put on the fire and start cooking. Like she's old school. So that's, and the food is just, I should take that's it. That's why it tastes food. so good. And she's cooking it over the fire. Like grandma knows. Yeah, I, I need to thank around. you there. Knock on wood, but I need to take it before she dies so she can create that and you can experience that. But that is one amazing. Even my my roommate right now where I stay, she's from the same um tribe like me. That's one thing I always beg her. Like and when we when we used to not stay together, because I'm crashing at her place since my fire, I, I, I would be like, I will bring champagne or wine. Can you make this? She makes amazing this, but she also comes from that tribe. So it's a very it's one of those comfort foods of mine. Like it reminds me of home, but bananas. I can eat that thing all day, every day. Like if you cook me bananas throughout my life, I will eat it. And then my mom's side, who comes from where like Nyasa is, I mean like like Nyasa, like Victoria, she comes around, uh, a tribe is where the lakes are. And she grew up there and their, and their food is called Ugali, where Nigerians call it fufu. It's, you know, white with flour. You, you make the flour and it comes round like a ball. So it's just flour turned into there. And my mom can eat that thing. It's called Ugali every day, every day, every day. Some African countries have the same food. Like Nigerians have that. They call it fufu. We call it Ugali, but it's the same thing. So is that Ugali, is it that made with teff? Because I know teff is a common grain in Africa. Or is that, or well, it's Ethiopian, so it's another country. But is it made with teff or is it made with wheat, do you know? Well, you can make it either way, depending on your, but it works either way, depending on what you prefer. You can also make it with cassava. You can also make oh, it yeah, with, cassava. Yeah. Yeah, so it's how you want it. But most of the one I eat is wheat, but people create it in any way. And so going back to the language thing, so is it like, so each tribe speaks their own di like dialect of Swahili or is it a completely different language on top of speaking Swahili? Swahili is the national language where everybody speaks it. My grandmother on my, on my dad's side tried to teach us because anytime we'd go to her place, if she calls you, she wants you to answer in the language because she was trying to teach us. Because unlike us generation, most of the other generations, their grandparents are still in the village. Do you get? So they go to the village to visit, they see the village, they learn. My grandparents were in the city. Until today, I've never been to any of my parents' village because they really don't have much. My dad right now has started um, cause Tanzania, we also do coffee. My dad has started graining coffee in our village and him and his brother has started creating more cause his brother married also a woman who's from the same village. So they go home for holidays. My aunt, her entire family goes home for holidays, celebrate, they've been building. So now my dad is, and his brother are starting doing the same. So hopefully next time I go home, I'll be able to go to, but other families, other traditions, because their families are still also in the village, they get to experience that. But it's a different language. Like every, like my dad and my mom can sit here and they can talk about each other in their different languages and none of them will know because nobody knows their language. That's pretty funny. That's awesome. And what is the coffee like in Tanzania? It's got to be amazing. Oh my God. Are you a coffee drinker? Yes. Okay, my sister is actually visiting me in Ju June from Tanzania. I'll ask her to bring you the coffee. It's <gasps> one of the best coffees. I'll send you a clip I did on Insta on Instagram because a Kenyan actually was like, Tanzania has the best coffee. And she she's Kenyan because I took it. I used to order a lot because I don't drink as much, but I would order them for my friends and everybody who has given them to either in America or Malaysia, they've they really say this coffee is good. So my sister is coming. Uh, I stopped ordering them because I was like, okay, who else do I have to give? Or like, But I will order some and I will give it to you and you'll try it. And when we do a part of this, you can tell me what you think about that. Heck Tanzanian yeah. Coffee. I've had Tanzanian uh, chocolate before and that was like off the charts. I love that. That was really good. So Because even if you go to Starbucks, you will see um, there was one Starbucks where I saw they had the grains from Tanzania and they even had a poster like Tanzanian grains. I was like, oh my God, I had to take a picture and send it like, oh my God. They have, um, Tanzania is known for its coffee grains, like amazing. Even my dad, because at one point me and my 
friend we're gonna start we we're gonna open a coffee shop and i was like since that you are I, i don't know the process but it was graining the grains or whatever whatever it's called i was like so are you gonna give us your grains to make up it's like we, we gotta work a business plan i'm not giving you can buy it <laughs> My dad is a lawyer, so anything to him. Come with me with a contract. Come with me with a business plan. Come. But I'll also make him get his grain and see. But I'll get you Tanzanian coffee and you can tell me. But so far from the coffee lovers, I've had nothing but good things. So let's jump into, so if we're going, if someone's going to Tanzania for the first time, they're, before they get there when they're planning. Oh, and I want to just let you know, my friends, if you are listening to this, you definitely want to, and you're planning on going to Tanzania or a foreign country, um, definitely get Kyle e- from Equal Eats. He was back on my episode six. Definitely get one of his translation cards. They're amazing for anybody that has food allergies. What are some like cultural considerations you have? to take into place like for example in japan you should never tip anybody which is a normal american thing because if you tip somebody in japan it insults them but what are some things that americans need to be aware of or anybody needs to be aware of when they go into tanzania well first of all just know that you're gonna have a blast tanzanians love foreigners way more than they actually sometimes love their own people which is something we we, <laughs> we are not as strict they love tips so be sure to tip just make sure that you have a trusted fund as much as I'd want to say most people are very nice and very helpful, but then they're also scumbag. So make sure you at least know one person who can really direct you. I tell this to anybody who goes to any country. Our, our street food, I, I understand stomach problems and food, it doesn't mix. The best way to learn and love Tanzanian food is our street food. Trust me, our hotels, yes, you might get the, the Swahili food, but they make it Americanized compared mm-hmm. to culture-wise. The street food, that's when you will really get to test the flavors. And, and trust me, our food is amazing. That is one thing I always... If they could DHL me food, I would probably never go back home. Because I just want the food. Just like Malaysia. Malaysia has amazing street food compared to... Well, also their restaurants are very well local. I wish every country would make their restaurants as local as how Malaysia makes them. Malaysia's restaurants, whether you're in a restaurant or you are in the street, it's the same unless you're very like in five star or four star. But So try the local food. Get a, a trusted tour guide. Don't do the American stuff. There are some people who I listen to them and when I ask them, oh, you went to Tanzania, where did you go? And everything they're telling me, I'm like, why did you even go there? You could have just stayed in America and done that stuff. Explore you want to go to, that. Yeah, you want to go to like the, the places that are there, right? Yeah, right. Don't be those people who travel everywhere and then still eat the hotel food or just do the same things you could have done in America. Our food is our number one. We eat so healthy. Vegetables? Oh my God. I hated them. I grew up with we foster, but they make them so good. You all think the soul food over here is something? We are all about eating healthy. We make amazing vegetable meals and we have very good local food. If all fails, make sure you try Zege. Zege is one thing that I tell everybody to try. Z-E-G-E. And it's very yeah. simple. It's fries, but fries cooked from potatoes, like turned into fries, in, and then they put it with eggs together. But I can cook it for you, but it won't make you feel the way you eat it in the streets in Tanzania. Yeah. <laughs> like, we cook it all the time. We're like, yo, this is good, but oh my God. If we were in the streets and, you know, the roads in Tanzania, I feel like because they are oil. You know, they say the longer the oil has been used and stayed, it makes the food even more. <laughs> when I do barbecues and when I use grills at the pool or whatever, I put a foil. Even though I know the more the, the barbecue is used, the better. The, you know how it feels like smoked and because people don't clean the grill. But then there's still that OCD in me like, I don't know who used it. I understand if it was my own grill, right? Our elders, they're nice people, but we one thing you know, and I actually even had an episode with Wally Green. And he is an American from Brooklyn. And he was shipped to Nigeria for two years because of uh, whatever he was going through. And he told me, Paula, one thing I learned about there, the elders demand their respect. And that's the thing we, we, like, if you see an elder, just greet them in the right manner. Like that, they don't know. Oh, so what, what is a proper greeting for some, like when you're in Swahili to greet somebody? Okay, we don't do um, some culture, but this is a culture thing. But in a normal way, just greeting them properly, like 
in Swahili, uh, we have this word called shikamo, mm -hmm. which shikamo is like the the grown. You give all the grown ups that greeting, like it's a uh, how are you doing? And then your friends, you tell them mambo. So you can say mambo to to a grown up. So just being respectful to to anybody who looks older than you, even if you don't understand the culture. But if you don't, they take that personally, and they might treat you like because of. I, they don't care if you're American or anything. To them, they understand that respect is respect to your elders. And if you can, if you want to win more points with them, just learn a few Swahili words. You know, Google Translator, get a Swahili book. Shout out to Vanessa and Rotimi. Those are two couples. One is Tanzanian, one is Nigerian. And they wrote an easy book guide to Swahili because she was teaching a man how to speak Swahili. And then they ended up, and I know they have a volume two out. It's on Amazon. They have a simple, like, and it's very small, very, like, the simple words that you would need. What is the author name again? Because I'll put those in the show notes. I'll put a link for that in the show notes. Vanessa Mdi, she used to be a rapper in Tanzania. She used to sing in Tanzania. She now lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, Rotimi, is, okay. is, 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 if you watch Power, you have seen Rotimi in that. He's a big superstar. So they wrote a book on a Swahili guidebook. Like it, it's a simple, nice book. Hey friends, Aliquity here. I had so much fun talking with Paula Mula Mula. We ended up talking for over an hour. So I'm breaking down this episode into two different episodes. So this is part one. So make sure you hit the follow and or subscribe button on whatever podcast player you're on. So you'll automatically get part two dropped to you next week. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Tune in again next week for part two of my talk with Paula Mula Mula, Travel Tips for Tanzania. Travel Gluten Free Podcast is a production of Travel Gluten Free LLC. Looking for a great way to connect with over 2,000 consumers per month? Contact Aliquity for information on sponsorship levels to boost your business. Subscribe today so you won't miss a single episode of Travel Gluten Free. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.